everyone. Hey. Welcome to the Detroit Comics say. Party, <laughs> episode 70. I'm Kevin, and Mike is Mike, and Chris Friend Chris. is a friend to all. How are yes. you, sir? Yeah. I'm doing really good, guys. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I'm really stoked. Oh, it is absolutely our pleasure. Uh, thanks for being on here. Um, can you? Where are you coming to us from exactly today? Because I know um, you're uh, you're a time zone that is uh, foreign to me. But yeah, uh, gonna, where, where are you? Uh, Hollywood. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Right by oh, the Hollywood. I, how's the comic scene in Hollywood? <laughs> Um, it's kind of cool. I mean, there's actually like, um, there's a small group um, I just started going to that meets like one Sunday a month um, at this cool taco place and just uh, share the kind of comics they're working on, you know, and it's like, those guys are like total pros, you know, it's like, um, it was neat meeting them, but they gave me like, you know, fully nice printed, like comic issues. I'm like, I just got this little like zine I'm working on, but, um, you know, it's like cool to have that little community, you know. And when like, you say I have a little zine, you mean I have a 400 page opus? <laughs> yeah, I guess so, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that was my read on it, but I've, I've only been on the Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it's, but it's I liked what I saw. More. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what do you guys what do you guys think about it? What um what's your thoughts? I, I, you I only saw your your Instagram for the first time like this morning. Kevin oh, was wow. like, he's going to be on the show tonight. And so I like <laughs> rinsed like a thousand pages on Instagram. But like, why do we know you? Are you just cool online and we learned about you that way? Or have we met in person? I'm not sure. Well, um, I don't think I've met you guys in person. Um, and uh, I'm not exactly sure. You know, it's like, um, you know, it's like I have kind of a lot of different friends, you know, that I meet. Um but um yeah i'm uh That's sort of cool. stoked um yeah sorry no no i was gonna, just gonna say we're always wondering that for everyone because i i can't remember anyone's name and we have a really good time when we go to expos and stuff and uh have a big comics party party but uh, usually afterwards, it's like, boy, those were some cool people. I wish I could remember one of their names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, we are good at remembering people whose work is dope. Yeah. And what I was thinking was, if we met you in real life, you would at least been a note in a notebook of remember this guy because his <laughs> comics is super dope. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But Thanks, those, man. I really appreciate it. It was super fly looking at your Instagram. Is that part of a book that comes out or Yeah. What? So I, I, I had this um short film uh recently like in Slam Dance. Um it was actually like at like festivals all over the world. And um this is a uh, sort of prelude comic um for when the short film actually goes public. Um it's a short film I spent um I guess about four years on, maybe like a little bit more. Um, it's like sort of like six minutes and just sort of jam packed with like, you know, animation and um, crazy live action performance stuff. And um, so people really liked it. And um, it's like sort of like an abstract hypnotic sort of thing, you know, that's kind of all about like um, uh, requiring people to view it, you know, like many, many, many times, you know, it's like, um, it's one of those like kind of first read, second read, third read sort of things, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so people liked it, um, but like a couple of the reviews, it's like, I actually got this review from this one festival and, um, uh, you know, it's like, it was an amazing review, you know, like, you know, two pages and stuff and they like loved it and everybody at the office loved it, you know, but the thing is, um, they said like at the end of the day, it's like nobody could actually say what it was about. And so they couldn't program it because it's like, you know, nobody could really kind of decide, you know, so it was the work of art and all that, but it just didn't really, they just didn't know if it had like, you know, actual meaning or like just sort of nonsense meaning. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, it's like, I kind of expected reviews like that. It's a good review, you know? So I started thinking, um, you know, I've already written all this like backstory and all this stuff, you know, that was like 
hard to really kind of squeeze in sort of subliminally, you know? Um, so I'm like, you know, I'll just make a comic with all that stuff. I mean, two of them actually, it's like, so this is going to be the prelude comic that like basically ends right where the short film begins. And then a bunch of like really gnarly stuff happens. Um, and we're in kind of like a whole different kind of place by the end of it. So then I'm going to do like a, um, epilogue comic, which will be the same length, probably like, I don't know, 800,000 pages or something. Um, but all about the sort of changes in the kind of narrative and like world. And, you know, it's like sort of, uh, you know, the sort of point of the thing, you know, anyways, it's like been really good getting this comic out. Cause it's like, it's one thing to have like sort of plot points, you know, graphed like a, B, C, D, E, but when you have to have like a, uh, you know, comic narrative, you know, it's like you have to actually kind of like walk the audience from uh, A to B. And sometimes that takes like, you know, a few pages, you know. Um, so having to actually do that, you know, it's like been cool because it's like I'm I was sort of frustrated before when I couldn't really sort of pinpoint certain things, you know, like about certain specific you know, specificalities, spec but then like being forced to do it, then it like actually makes it much more like an epic sort of event, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's like what I'm kind of hoping is just that like, you know, once the short film becomes public, you know, it's like then people can always like fall back on this and be like, oh yeah, that's that character and this is this character and they like ended up here because of this. And that's like what this thing's just like spelling out in detail, you know? So like, that's cool. So, so do, yeah. you, do you think like, so in your mind, are people reading the comic first once everything is finished or is it kind of just either, either way? Um, I was thinking it'd be kind of the opposite, you know, cause it's like, there's going to be a lot bigger audience for being public, you know, cause we'll like partner with some kind of a big magazine, you know, I'm hoping like, you know, um, kind of a big fashion magazine or art magazine, you know, whoever wants to take us up, you know, like, and, uh, kind of partner on like the actual release and release party. And then, um, you know, it's like, there'll be some like black light posters and, you know, it's like issues of the physical comic, you know, cause it's like, I'll yeah. print them up all at once. It's like probably about 15, like 24 page issues, like sort of zine style, you know? So it's yeah. like, photocopy interior but then kind of like a nice like you know uh cardstock stitch cover you know but um nice. you know pop all that shit on sale make the thing go public and that way you know people kind of want to like buy in on it you know they can kind of like you know they're like what's this thing actually about you know i guess i'll read the comic you know Anyways. i have to say that's a surprisingly detailed and sensible business plan for someone who can do a comic that is <laughs> weird, weird and fucked up and but, like wild but that's what good what is it like to think like that where i think we think we'll put out a con well we're gonna produce uh 200 uh an edition of 200 of our new comic and that's it. We've gotten uh, hot off hot off the f fucking copy machine, and we have a backpack full of comic books, and that's the end. And it's like, well, maybe we'll go to Pittsburgh Zine Fair. We'll hope to sell some. And <laughs> like, that's the end of the business plan. Like, well, well but where well, does the business? Where does the idea of even making comics into a business? come from or can, well, wait, how do you explain really quick. it to a lay person like us wait 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 what i think is actually really funny about your story though that's like um the the other part of that story is like yeah we'll get the comics in our backpack and then we'll have like events and we'll have a killer podcast and the whole like awesome show on like public access and it's like then you guys are like experts in this field just because of wanting to do a comic right so it's like it's just a sort of opposite way of approaching something you know um Okay. So for me, it's like, right, I've got like a sort of, um, I guess, advertising sort of background, because it's like, that's kind of what I do for a living is visual effects, you know, that are like, it's like 
for post companies, it's, it's usually commercials that are going out. So we're working on little like spots like a Nike ad, you know? And it's like, you know, it's like you're kind of in the room with the people that are like making all the creative pitches, you know, and it's like like my um my old mentor, you know, won an Oscar last year, you know, uh for two distant strangers, best short film. But um, you know, it's like being around people like that, you know, it's like this is the way that they think, you know. It's like even when they're approaching a um you know, a client job, you know, it's like they kind of think out all aspects of it and like how to maximize it and maximize the resources. And so they may have, you know, five different people and they got different skills and sort of assign them and make this thing happen, you know? And it's like, for me, it's like, um, you know, I just like blew all my money on this like four year long short film. So it's like, and all the favors. So I'm like, yeah, the only thing left is what I can do entirely myself, you know? Like, I got to do something when this thing finishes the festivals, you know, otherwise it's like, I'm going to be like, oh, it's public, you know, but <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, yeah. this way, it's like, I can get some people in like through my art and story writing, you know, and they could be like, oh, it ends up like this. Um, and then I can get other people who are like, yeah, it's like a cool short film, but doesn't really mean anything. And then other people can be like, oh, well, you didn't read the comics. Right. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't explain anything, you know. Right. And then that makes a, a dialogue with people, you know, and then that spreads the word a little bit, hopefully, you know, like it's like a puzzle, you know. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to not project, but I'm, I have to anyway, uh -huh. where our most one of our most recent things that we finished was a comic that we then turned into a short film uh -huh. and then ha have gotten uh, nine rejections so mm -hmm. far from film festivals, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which I know in the long run and, uh, you know, percentage wise was probably not the worst, but still it's like, I think uh, the idea of approaching it from a, sensible like here's how i either expect or or would like the audience to interact with this thing and maybe even like sequentially what will they see and when and how and stuff like that is uh at least for me that feels like something that's beyond me because by the time i have like some time and energy to make things it's like i'm just like it's just got to it's got to come out in whatever way it comes out in that moment and the, and then you know see what happens after that but nah, i don't know you'll get there you know i mean it's just a matter of like you know kind of taking some time out you know cuz it's like you know I, I think like that's how i even came up with the thing is i'm looking at the skills that you know i've got and you know the things that i like to do and want to do and kind of like you know i um i do this thing like it's a kind of normal exercise thing called mind mapping you know you can just do it on a piece of paper where you like draw a concept in the middle and then you do sort of spider graph you know where you draw a line out and then make a word or a picture you know and you kind of like explore concepts you know so it's like i usually start my projects that way because i'm like here's a bunch of stuff you know and it's like i use like a digital version so you can actually like move all the little bubbles around and throw yeah. in a picture you know so i'm like this is some stuff that I'm into right now. And then I'm like, you know, how can I write a narrative around it? And then here's the resources I got, you know, it's like, um, like, uh, you know, I directed this Dropkick Murphy's video like about 10 years ago. And it's like actually their number one viewed video with like 150 million views now, you know, and it's like the only reason why I got it was it's like the budget was so low. Nobody else in the office could take it. They like pitch some ideas, you know, to the band and the label, but it's like the budget was so low that they couldn't even bring on a few people. And so it's like only enough budget for one person, which is me, you know, for two weeks. And so I wrote up a pitch of like what I could do. And so I figured um, I could get out with like the company's, you know, Canon 5D and like get on my bike and like, you know, take a train down to like a city that I know has like a bunch of like working class people, you know, make a list of like, you know, tattoo parlors, Irish pubs, um, places where street people hang out, you know, 
you just go there with like a big stack of singles, you know, and some like release forms and like interview people. So I go into like a tattoo parlor and I'm like, Hey, you know, you mind if I film a second or while you do something, get some stills, get some interview stuff, you know, uh, homeless people, you know, it's like runaway kids, you know, it's like the whole thing, you know, take the bus back, you know, it's like the homeless guy across the, the way from me, go to like the cemetery, shoot a bunch of shit and then like cut it all together is like, you know, black and white stills, you know, in the next week, you know, like to a rad song, you know, and it's like, it was actually supposed to be what's called a lyric video, which is like the sub kind of lame video where it's just the words. Sure. Yeah. Right. And I hadn't put the words in yet. And it's like the band loved it so much. They're like, yeah, you know, we want this to be the actual video, you know, so don't put the words in there, but here's a bunch of like pictures of like, you know, my kids and like, the boxing gym that I own and like my favorite boxer who's like on my, in my ring, you know, and like me and the guys, you know? And so, you know, I cut all that in. So it's like a kind of really emotionally, it's called a Rose tattoo. If, if you want to check it out or anybody wants to check it the out, but it's song. like, yeah, it's like black and white and really gritty. So it's mostly kind of stills, right. Telling the story. So the pitch I wrote was like that. It's like, a POV of like a day in the life of like a working class dude, you know? So it's like all the stuff he sees, like the, by the train station, then his buddies, blah, blah, blah. And like drinking and this, and then like the cemetery when he's like going to get like go more in his like, you know, parents or something, you know? And so it's like, it's all cut together in that kind of way. Cause it's like the song is about um, somebody with a rose tattoo, you know, it's like that they've got like this rose tattoo to represent someone who died, you know? And so it's like, there's a bunch of really good material in the song, you know, because it's like kind of this moving thing, you know, and it's like, people loved it, you know, and it's like very little resources because it's just like, you know, just whatever one person can do, you know. Um, so it's like, to me, it's like all about that kind of idea. It's like, oh, yeah, and I did that with the mind mapping, right? So it's like, I just kind of mind mapped out the ideas I wanted and then what I could do. And like, you know, they gave me... Um, you know, like my bosses are acting as the producers. So basically it's like keeping me in line, you know? So it's like, okay, you've got like two days to shoot this, you know? So it's like, you can borrow the camera, but you know, after two days you're fucking done and you got to edit what you got, you know? And you got like, you know, three days to edit. We're going to send it off at this point. You know, I'm like, fuck. You know, yeah, don't so get like, greedy <laughs> making this huge this video for this huge band with our, our one camera. Don't get, don't be taking three days, yeah. right? <laughs> but so, I don't know that. See, that sounds like right place, right time. Eclipse of uh, you know stars in a row. That is what's also good about comics, where it's like you were like, I need uh, maybe a ticket. And a camera, and I will leave, <laughs> yeah. and I will come back with a video for you. And in the same yeah. way that comics is like, you know what? Like, I've got pencil and this stack of copy paper that I stole. I'm I will make a comic. But yeah, so, that's, that's exactly like it. that's uh I don't know, good, solid punk style. I think you yeah know? yeah. And then right? sometimes those things end up being better than a thing that they spent a zillion dollars on, you know? Like, I I think the there's a Coffin Cats video my wife directed that's one DV camera and one light in a basement, and that's, like, their top fucking video. Like, it's, it's yeah. like, it's nuts. So, yeah. I, that that's, it's the best when that works out. That's, well, that's it, sweet. It, it's like you limit the resources and it's like what you end up having to make is way better than it's like if you could just fucking ask for anything, you know? Yeah, totally. DIY well, yeah, because like style. things are going to happen that you're not expecting. You're, you're just kind of walking around open to cool things happening in front of you and, you know, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. And I hope you guys don't think I was just complaining about having limited resources. I, I love didn't, having limited resources. I didn't think That's that. My, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was, like, just tunneling down into my own self-consciousness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go to your camera? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Uh, this is a great show. Um, <laughs> well, I thanks. Like the vibe a lot. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, I was I was just curious, you know, like I wanted to ask you a little bit about the comics and kind of just see like I don't know. It's a dumb question, but it's like what what like what do you like? Like what what do you what are some just give us like a few of the mind map things and and maybe like how how you feel like like is the best or most interesting way that uh to turn those into a comic story yeah well um you mean kind of like what was my inspiration or like you mean kind of like yeah i didn't want to say that but yeah what's your what's your inspiration like yeah so for me like my personal inspiration for this short film and thus the comic you know Mm -hmm. like this um it's this sort of field um that i became really interested in you know and it's like it's sort of weird because it's like sometimes you have these like words that like say like kleenex right it's like a nose tissue but everybody says kleenex even though it's like kleenex is actually a brand right but mm-hmm. you'd never correct like the winchester like that. exactly right in the 1800s <laughs> yeah and so there's a term called uh, cybernetics right and because of like cyberpunk and stuff you know people and because it became so popular in fiction the fiction definition took over the actual definition and the fiction definition means something totally different i mean the fiction definition just is another word for bionics you know right so bionics is the actual word for what that is like the literal science of bionics you know it's like it's like doing like artificial arms you know it's like i need a bionic eye like the bionic man but the word's really lame especially with bionic man or bionic woman. So you wouldn't have like bionic punk, you know, because it sounds like the worst thing ever. But people started having cyberpunk. And then when people talk about the cyberpunk project, it's like, um, it's like, I've got a fake jaw and then my arm turns into a gun, you know, like, but um, the actual field of cybernetics is so big that um, almost all the kind of current stuff like cool stuff we know about was originally part of that um, tree trunk. And so it's like the things that came out of that tree trunk are like um, artificial intelligence, game theory, social networks, um, modern like corporation theory, um, like different kinds of like advertising. Like it's like pretty much everything that like happened after the seventies kind of like, you know, um, corporate wise, you know, like corporate communication and like, having franchises, you know, like franchises is a very, is actually a very like cybernetic concept. So the term, the field of cybernetics came right after World War II as a response to World War II. So it actually comes from the word uh, like Kyber and netics. So Kyber means like a steersmanship or government. Then netics is like the study of, so it's actually literally the study of government or like how to control people or control information. Huh. So it's basically, yeah. So basically it's like, there's all these cyberneticists in the fifties that wrote all the different cybernetics books. Then there's the second wave of cybernetics in the um, sixties and seventies. Who's the guy that I'm really into is from whose name is um, Stafford Beers. And he wrote a whole bunch of books like part of the firm. Um, You know, it's about corporations so his whole theory was taking the work of the early cyberneticists, whose kind of like main impulse was sort of like, it's like kind of doing like, a, like the way, you know, you have like, like a mashup, you know, for music, but it's a mashup of sciences. So it's like taking some stuff from like electrical engineering and then applying it to sociology and psychology, right? So instead of like working with like, electrodes and electricity it's like you're working with people and uh information and a uh, motivation you know so it's like who knows what who's motivated by what you know it's like what kind of motivation does somebody need and then make a system out of that and so that, that's how the modern corporations came about is like mapping out all the departments and so it's like where he really made his name is he got hired by the government of uh, Chile back in the 60s. And uh, the Chile president, like, wanted to run the entire country cybernetically. And so at the time, they had, like, these early internet 
called telex machines, which were like typewriters hooked mm -hmm. up to the telephone systems, you know? And so the idea was to connect all the telephone lines of all the factories throughout Chile to like a central hub that would actually have a big readout center. So they built this hub, you know, they designed it out, you know, they had a bunch of like cool designers come in and they built the whole thing. So it like looks like the bridge from Star Trek. So it's like a very like late sixties era, kind of like 2001, like a uh, hexagon white fiberglass room with these like, uh, I guess six like control chairs, like facing each other in a circle. And then they had a little like, like buttons built in, you know, like remote control stuff. I mean, it's totally Star Trek inspired. And then these big display screens that were actually like um, backlit. So it's like you basically have a uh, kind of semi-transparent like graphic design and then like diodes behind different spots. So the diodes like bloop, 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 you know, fill in the design like it's an early computer display without is an actual comic. Is this what your comic is about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's exactly with what this about. level of complexity and that's why it's a thousand yeah. freaking pages yeah oh my god so I'm basically die. it's like yeah so basically it's trying to explain the concept of cybernetics to people so it's like there's basically these different social systems that are like dramatically different from each other and then like kind of separate it you know and so you got like people who live in like totally different realities and then pitted against each other, you know? So it's like, you got these people that live cool. in domes and they don't leave the domes except like in like kind of uh, remote control, like killing robots. And so then they like kill all the people who are outside the domes, you know, that's kind of the, the thing. So it's based on cybernetics. And so cybernetics like exploded in the uh, late 60s and became all these different fields. And then nobody used the term cybernetics anymore. They just talked about artificial intelligence and uh, game theory and, you know, applying the stuff like in a corporation. So it's like all of Stafford Beer's books, his entire thing is based on um, the analogy between the human brain and the corporation. So you imagine the corporation as all these little sub departments of the human brain, and then the information that flows between them and then what motivates them. So it's like one idea is like that people work really good under certain kind of crises. So you can actually just make a crisis, but it's like inside the department, you know, it's like funding has been cut and people are going to get fired unless we like, really like get it moving you know it's like this other department's doing way better and they're taking our funding what are we gonna do oh fuck we gotta like crunch time you know <laughs> right <laughs> but it's like that you can you know back in the 60s they were graphing that out like on like graph paper and like filling in the blanks like part of the chile plan that didn't actually go into effect but they wanted to like give every single citizen like kind of like a very small kind of like tv remote control you know, with just a single dial. So the dial went from uh, happy face to frowny face, right? And so they would just <laughs> turn the dial into like whatever the household was sort of feeling at the time. You know, it's like, oh, fuck, disaster, frowny face all the way, right? And then like on the readout, you're like, oh, you know, production has like halted in like the Northern factory and the unhappiness levels are spreading out. You know, it's like, but these people are really happy. Let's divert their resources up there. And then like, we'll get the system back under control. You know, that's the idea. And so Stafford Beers wrote the whole book about it. So he explained everything. Then there's like books about the actual project where it's like, I think it's a girl from MIT and she went and like interviewed like everybody that was sort of affected by it. You know, it's like, cause well, oh yeah. So what happened was they basically, they built the thing. They built the computer room, but they didn't have a lot of money. That's why they're using the telex machines because they didn't, you know, have many resources. So it's like they built this computer room, but it kept overheating. And so they couldn't actually get the thing to happen. I mean, it was supposed to be the prime minister and the 
Minister of Economics and all these people in this room together. And it's like, it just wasn't happening. And then uh, the prime minister got assassinated. They're like, it's too hot in here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the prime minister got assassinated. Dead. A revolution in the country. Dictator takes over. Right. So that's uh, 1972, I think. Right. And then the like fascist dictatorship ruled Chile for the next 15 years. Right. And so that project obviously never went ahead, you know, and like all the people that were involved in the project, you know, got, you know, imprisoned, you know, for, you know, being part of the um, bad guys or whatever. That hot you know. Star Trek room. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dang. That's such an interesting, that's an interesting story. So when, when we're talking about your story being, about that it's is it literally or in spirit because yeah. it seems like it's taking place you know it's sort of an extrapolated future where like yeah those ideas were are more prevalent or like there's been a splintering of society into these little mini enclave things sort of i i think yeah, what i like about it when i'm when i'm reading it is like it it does something that all good sci-fi stuff does which is like you you're explaining a lot through the characters actions and and what they're saying but it feels like it's they're not surprised by any of it like it's part of yeah. their everyday like they're that's them living in that world <laughs> which i think is really good like so when it, it's like oh you flip the page it's like uh what is it was a semi-recent one of like it's like 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 spake the shit out of me to r get rid of my bourgeois thoughts or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like some weird, <laughs> totally. it's, it's just like it's like oh yeah, that thing that we do to solve that problem regularly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I don't know. That's I I like that a lot. That's cool to know, sort of where some of those ideas came from. That's interesting. Have, awesome. Are you? Uh, d does any of that stu stuff still physically exist, or was it all destroyed by angry dictators? Like any of the like facilities or anything um, like that. The facilities were destroyed, but um, you know, a lot of the people were still alive, and so it's like a lot of them got interviewed. So it's like this this MIT book that came out. I think it's called like <sighs> Cybernetic Pioneers or something. I know I've, I've got it back there. I mean, I could find the book but anyways it's like um this researcher who spent seven years like tracking down like everybody she could you know who were affected in any way shape or form you know people who were close to the project itself or factory owners who had to deal with it or you know whatever it's like and she um got all sorts of interviews and it's like i mean it's like all the stuff is like you know a lot to like dig into you know it's like but yeah, the thing you were saying about the, um, yeah, the people with their weird stuff. So basically, it's like, you know, I'm kind of inspired by, um, you know, like, I, I think, I think we've lost so much of the specific thing nowadays with like, you know, instant communication. But if you look at, you know, 500 years ago, where you've got like, you know, um, distances of communication between you know, people in groups, you know, the differences start to like actually accumulate more, you know? And, um, For you know sure. what, like one, one of my biggest inspirations was actually like, I don't know if you guys remember the Eon Flux cartoon, of course, Peter mm -hmm. Chung, liquid television, you know? So it's like, I did some like research into Peter Chung, you know, it's like, cause that's like such a main inspiration. So I'm like, how did he write this? You know? So I guess his, um, his dad was actually the, American diplomat, well, like the South Korean American diplomat. So it's like he was friends with the prime minister, you know? And so they grew up in South Korea, but there was these American connections because of the dip, you know, being a diplomat, you know? And the prime minister was like a family friend, you know, and he got assassinated by like an assassin from North Korea. And so the Chungs had to flee to America and so Peter Chung ended up being like in LA, like 11 or something, not being able to speak a word of English, you know, right? And the thing is, it's like, after 
just hearing that little bit, I like went back and the whole thing with the influx, the two different city states and the wall and Trevor Goodchild, you know, I'm like, right. oh, it's totally North and South Korea, right? But it's more than North and South Korea. It's like that idea of like, you know, cultures that are like diametrically opposed, but like the information is sort of limited, you know? So basically it becomes like, you guys are the villains and we're the heroes, right? <laughs> and uh, dehumanizes the other side, you know? And um, I think that that concept is really interesting in so many different formats, you know? It's like that idea of, like, in-group, out-group, you know, even in, like, generation gaps or whatever, you know? We had the counterculture of the 60s, you know? It's like, if you look at, like, the Get Back thing that, you know, just came out, you know, it's, like, weird to think about the Beatles being these, like, this cultural pioneers at the time. And it's, like, we look at them now and it's, like, oh, I could totally just be friends with that guy. You know, it's like a normal kind of person. But back then it wasn't normal at all. You know, it's like that they were like at the forefront of, you know, being like, oh, I'm a dude that like hangs out and like makes crazy music, you know? And um, it's weird to even think about the Beatles of 63, like having to pretend to be the boys next door, you know? But, you know, but before that, they were like leather jacketed, like greaser teddy boy types, you know? It's like they had to get cleaned up it's like, oh, yeah, I'm just the chap next door. And then it's like, as soon as they got popular enough, they're like, yeah, psych, you know, <laughs> Sergeant Pepper. And, you know, it's, <laughs> but the whole world went through that in the 60s. Anyways, I think that's and, cool. Yeah. I, I think before we get too far away from the Aeon Flux big North and South Korea thing, I was thinking earlier about, um, I had just pulled my Neuromancer off the shelf to mm. revisit that this weekend yeah. and I was thinking all the best all the best fiction in general and all the best sci-fi in particular you should be able to just smack that on any like cultural problem and it be pretty accurate or uh, appropriate and I feel like that works with Aeon Flux and that works with uh, all the best William Gibson and well, probably yeah. more than newer William Gibson too, but but like that was just a thought I was having. I think, dude, again, Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash, yeah. I think fucking Neuromancer is awesome, dude. <laughs> oh yeah, it's the most classical <laughs> yeah. of everything. And you think, oh, it's about it, it. Like, how did he write that? He he saw a computer once, and then he wrote yeah. Neuromancer. <laughs> yeah, he saw the first computer. <laughs> <laughs> or he heard his friend had a computer at his home. Is that what it was? And then he took his typewriter. So. And he just like, goes, Neuromancer. This is fucked up. <laughs> this is fucked up. <laughs> Types in this style. <laughs> as, as, is as is his way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I don't I was I was thinking too about like you know I think about that idea a lot of that like these cultural differences in places that are very near to each other is something that really is just going away. Like when you have, to, well, the when you have at least the illusion of total access to information at all times and, and stuff, like it's a very weird concept to like, you know, my, um, my wife and I worked on a mini documentary that was about, um, like Mexican ballet folklorico dance stuff. And like, cool. it's like this dance tradition where they have all these beautiful costumes and like this, you know, accordion music and stuff. And like it, some like the instrument and stuff, I think it came from like German settlers in Mexico wow. and like South Texas and stuff. And then it became this whole like mixed with the culture that was already there and turned into this like style of performance and stuff. But in describing it, like the people who know a lot about it, they, they describe it as like, yeah, you could be like 12 miles away from the next town over and everything about it is different. Like wow. all the costumes are different. All the music is completely different. You could identify like which town each of the dances came from because you don't walk 12 miles every day. You don't go hang out somewhere yeah. that's 12 miles away for fun and then go home. Like, that's too far. So, so like, just I, I think a lot about that idea of, like, 
is there a way to like, well, I don't know if you wait long enough, maybe society just falls apart and that happens anyway. But like, is there a way to maintain some comfort level, but incentivize that kind of like cultural, I know it sounds like horrible, but like this like positive cultural siloing, <laughs> maybe at least for like certain periods of time or something, or like how to incentivize like, okay, well, if you're a radio station or a TV show in, in this area, I think you should get like a bunch of money if you play stuff that's from within like 15 miles of where your station is like something like that, you know, like how, how do you yeah. encourage yeah. that kind of like, and that makes me think of the, all the Canadian stations where it's like, and hey, we have to play uh, like for every uh, 60 minutes of music we play, we have to play 45 minutes of music that was recorded in or produced in or by Canadian artists. And I think that's, crippling like culturally crippling really? but when just because it's when, canadian no, 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 no. <laughs> well when you say okay. when you have a station that's like well we have a whole world of music and we're incentivized to play just this uh large vector canada versus the whole world and i think that's crippling culturally but if it was from 15 miles of where you broadcast from, just think how many, just if we broadcast from here, how many hours of brand new rap music that came out today we could broadcast every day that was only rappers who were recorded or lived 15 miles from here. Yeah. It would be the most vibrant and exciting radio or TV station you've ever seen in your life. So you're saying the problem with that is still that the pool it was, is too big, like in the Canadian example. Where well, it's right. like, but you can like, play it from anywhere in the country, which it, still includes their giant music industry, just, which just, is all the right. but just stuff think they if, would play anyway. If we had a radio station that was like, we needed to only play records from... Detroit or Metro Detroit, yes. we would be inundated. We couldn't keep up. We couldn't possibly parse the new releases in time to curate a meaningful or cool or good sounding show. Yeah. I, there's so oh boy, we're on a really big idea that I'm not at all capable of uh, <laughs> figuring out right now. That is a good idea. I, I got an idea for it. Hyper separatism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got an idea on how to make that happen, actually. Um, you know, one of my uh, really good friends, um, her name's uh, Haley Kinnipin. Uh, she actually lived in Mexico and told me about that dance. And, you know, she's kind of down there because um, she's really interested in the kind of, I mean, I mean, cultural stuff in general. I mean, I don't mean just like, you know, Latino culture, but, you know, the idea of studying that kind of stuff. And so she's doing this little project right now that's based around um, like actual physical art like original physical art like small as like money you know um mm -hmm. and so she's doing this project where she's generating the almost like nfts but not digital right it's like paper right and then laminated fungible tokens exactly right <laughs> and then it's like sort of giving it away to certain people like you know based on like you know a roll of a dice or something you know but i think that if you had that kind of like artist currency in any place you know, you'd have something like it's like the, you know, Detroit dollar or something, you know. And so it's like, it. W I mean, it could go to some place in Austin. You know, it's like, oh, I've got one Detroit dollar here in Austin, you know. But the thing is, most of it's going to be like more centralized. And that could happen anywhere if you just kind of spread that idea kind of like zines. You know, it's like you could release a zine that has like an included um, Detroit dollar in it, you know. And then um, maybe somebody in Japan could collect these Detroit dollars, you know, it's like, maybe that means a lot to them, you know? So it's like, it's geographic kind of by nature, but it could extend like, you know, with some kind of cultural similarity, you know? I mean, I'm, I just bring it up cause it's like, I'm on that same vibe. Cause for me, like in the kind of, for my kind of like mid nineties, like kind of punk era thing, 
you know, we had like mixtapes, you know, where, you know, it's like, you know, you couldn't really get a lot of the stuff except if you went to like a cool punk record store. But, you know, this guy had like the tape. And so you go over to his house and, you know, you you record a copy, you know, or like, you know, maybe you meet somebody new and they like make you a mixtape, you know, and you don't know where to get any of these bands except like, through them or you know other people that they're friends with and they know all these other weird bands but it's like i think the idea of, of like making anything physical really you know it's like you could do a um like one of those airpod trackers or something and like a little sculpture and it's like it's, it's a physical object that you actually have to give to somebody and so that would keep the shit geographic you know and so it's like i think that stuff like that would naturally actually develop you know and that we'll probably see that stuff, you know, probably sooner than later. I mean, I mean, think about the popularity of NFTs. I mean, that was only a few years ago and now it's like a joke almost because it's like, but at a certain point, nobody knew what it was. And then it's like suddenly oversaturated and people like don't trust them or something, you know, um, <laughs> but you know, next thing could be the Detroit dollar. Tr- there's something I don't trust about this million dollar JPEG. There's something a little weird about it. I don't, I can't quite put my finger on it. Yeah, but yes. something is weird here. But <laughs> also, there, there, <laughs> there's like multi-layered complexity to this though, because we, if we learn about this really cool comic coming out of Hollywood, like what the fuck ever good came out of Hollywood? Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I would be, I would be less inclined to get yeah. a Hollywood. Comic. More skeptical, but I got to see a taste of it on your Instagram. And now it's like the thing I want the most. Like I wow, want this comic. Amazing. I'm putting value on this thing, which one day I'm going to have the paper one of, which I can just go whoo, 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 scrub the Instagram. And it's, it's delicious. Like I love it, but awesome. I only want the paper now. I want yeah. the paper. And uh-huh. that's something I want to search out and get. And I have it. Oh, well, you have I a got pending a wholesale order from Detroit Comics uh-huh. Party, For and sure. we do distro aggressively. <laughs> uh, I, I've actually got a booth at the Artist Alley at the Long Beach Comic Con. Like, I think it's in September. And so um, I'll send you guys out some um, free Our issues. beach is here yeah. along. <laughs> <laughs> the whole outside of it, the thing is just a big, long beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm deflecting that I don't know what or where that is. <laughs> oh wow, that's yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love is that, that a regional big stuff though. Comical con. Um, I guess so. It's like I'm not really, I'm not really hip on the comic cons. You know, it's like this kind of my first. I've never even been to one. You know, so it's like this is kind of you know. I'm like. I don't know what's the one that's coming up that's close by me, you know, like Long Beach, I guess. But I guess the point is, uh, I got a deadline, so I'm going to make it and uh, I'll send you guys some copies, you know. Um, Sweet. You know, yeah. Love to like well, have I'm that in you guys' hands. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll take a picture of our hands touching it. Mm-hmm. it I got weird. a black light poster. It'll be it real too. weird. Huh? I got a black light poster for it too, like screen print. Um, oh, so nice. like, Sweet. Yeah, like a big, like kind of weird abstract thing. It's actually the first thing I did on the whole project. It's just this poster, and then kind of started it. You know, so um, it's gonna be fun to circle see your back. Film and... now. Oh yeah, I'll send is you guys it still links. Festival only, or is it their secret link? Um, I'll send you guys. Check the links. graphic below for the secret link. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah. kidding. No, uh, no, you I'm know, just kidding. you know, he's got the secret link. He off the air. He's gonna send the secret link to us, and then we're gonna send the secret link to him, and we'll trade secret oh, film yeah. links. Yeah. 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 And there's also on this half hour uh, talk show where we've talked for an hour, uh, wow. also uh, where we spent the whole time talking about how. Oh, scarcity is important in art. <laughs> We're gonna put the links out. There. Just, just check yeah. the links. Check the, the link links, the everyone. Link. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh my god. Also, I'm gonna put. We usually put a sassy like phrase at the end 
if we remember, like, at the end of the credits, and this to this episode's is just going to say, zines are money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm also going to make that a t-shirt. That'll be a t-shirt, too. Tomorrow. Check Actual the link. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going to need five things for that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. They'll be for money. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Our zines are money. Oh, this also Everyone else's zines. This also, this also Not so think, much. This also makes me think of the Isaac Marmondo shirt that already exists that I designed. Which one? It says, make your or suicide note a zine. Mm, <laughs> it's yeah. just like the print is this big. The whole front. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, that's my next zine. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag zines are money. Hashtag cybernetics. So, wait. So, oh, yeah. what the... Okay. So, it meant the, like something like the study of government or, some, or the learning of government... And uh, now it's sort of used as like a, you're saying not many people use it at all, but it's also when it is used, it's sort of a blanket term for like well, cyborg stuff and bi- bionic yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, limbs But I think stuff. things, that question from before about like William Gibson, right? He's got a fucking typewriter, right? He's seen a computer. He's like, I know somebody who has a computer. I watched him boot it up. Oh my God, this mm-hmm. has blown my mind. I'm going to read some books on computers and cybernetics, right? I'm going to make a cyberpunk thing, you know? It's like, it's going to be like William Gibson meets like um, street trash with cybernetics. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and like that, that's like what it is, except Hell the thing yeah. is it's like, like Neil Stevenson clued in on that because he was around the same time. So he's like looking at Neuromancer and he's like, oh yeah, fucking snow crash. It's like the cyberspace, right? And then everybody else is like, yeah, and he's got a cyborg arm that turns into a shotgun. And then the other one's got cyborg wings and he flies around, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah, and there's neon and there's black, you know? It's like, it's cyberpunk, you know? And it's like just so lame, you know? It's like, it, it really sucks to me that, like, I mean, that's actually how I learned about cybernetics. Is I'm like, what is the cyberpunk thing anyways? Cybernetics, what is that? And you just go to Wikipedia and you're like, cybernetics on Wikipedia. And it like shows you all the shit, you know? And it's like, wait a yeah. minute, what? And you look up like that <laughs> Chile project, which is called CyberSyn. So it's Cyber, S-Y-N. And you can see all the fucking, the, the room. It's insane. Like, it like... I mean, if you see something like that in a movie, I mean, it looks like, uh, you guys remember that movie Beyond the Black Rainbow? Oh, yeah. Do we remember it? <laughs> Dude. Yeah, I mean, it's like the real what life Beyond the movie. Black Rainbow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, the, but with like a fucking whole country and like, you know, I mean, if it had ever happened, you know, you, you know that you'd have like the prime minister in the control chair the whole time and he's like, minister of like, emotions you know how do we increase <laughs> you know right except now we have zuckerberg as that right you know we've i mean got, that's he's what... sitting in the chair cranking the thing all the way to happy just going like right? we've got to send out more scenes to the impoverished areas of chile <laughs> <laughs> well that's fucking sweet i am really looking forward to seeing the rest of the com the other four hundred pages of this comic yeah, and, yeah. and your film. I'm, I'm very excited awesome. and uh, we're very grateful for you uh, joining us today. And it was uh, super nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's like incredible. You guys' this whole vibe is so awesome. Like, um, so yeah, I'd love a link to this this show too because it's like um, I'd like to share this if I could. You know, um, you bet. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, it's awesome. So that'll um, be three. Thank zines. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, three zines in the mail, snail mail. Hell yeah! Well, Chris, I'll thank you again on. for joining us. This has been cool. wonderful. Thank you for awesome. all the wonderful information and a good time. And uh, I'm gonna we'll we'll see all of our viewing audience next time. Yes. And we always yeah. wave yeah. awkwardly awesome. cool. to oh. them at the <laughs> yeah. camera. It's this one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>